What's up guys, Standard Lifestyle. We're gonna build a custom Pitman arm and talk about whether or not you need one. Today's video is brought to you by Empire Abrasives. Consumable supplies like cutoff wheels and flap discs add to the total cost of our projects and now you can buy quality products in bulk and save yourself a bunch of money. When you're putting together the budget for your next project, make sure you check out EmpireBracives.com to see how you can save a little extra time and money. And if you want to save even more money, use coupon code DIRTLIFESTYLE at checkout if it's your first time shopping with them, and you'll save an additional 10%. For those of you who are new to the channel, I want to get you up to speed. This is a 2003 Land Rover Discovery, and we're putting a set of Ford Super Duty axles in it, and we're having an issue with the pitman arm. So the front axle is welded, everything is, is done, all the suspension has been built. We did all this earlier in the series. Same story with the rear axle. The Sterling 10 and a half, is, it just looks perfect under there. The suspension is functioning perfectly. And the only issue that I'm having thus far is contact between my tie rod and that joint that's off the bottom of our pitman arm. Now the tie rod can't be moved and I went over that earlier in the series and I showed um, exactly why. So there's just packaging constraints, that's the short story. And what we need to do is move this joint in a way that's gonna accommodate more up travel. Right now it's contacting at about three inches of up travel over normal ride height. And I wanna make sure that we can change that because I don't want to limit our up travel to three inches. There are a lot of builds out there that do limit to three inches, but I'd like something a little bit closer to five. And after pulling out the tape measure, taking measurements of our shocks, we have enough room for uh, more than five, in fact. And the first thing that's gonna contact is gonna be our 37 inch tire on the top of our wheel well. So that's perfect. What we're gonna do is we're gonna limit the suspension out to five, but before we can get to that five inches, we're gonna have to build a custom pitman arm. Before we get started building our custom pitman arm, I wanna talk about the basics of pitman arm design and uh, what to do and what not to do. This right here would be basically a stock steering box, stock pitman arm orientation. This is the most common where it's flat, you don't have any drop. And this is definitely gonna give us the most strength. And this is what we're shooting for whenever we're gonna build a custom pitman arm. This would be like if you put a small drop pitman arm on a JK or a TJ or um, a Toyota, whatever, you lift it up a little bit and you need to match that angle from the drag link to the pan hard bar. So you use a drop pitman arm to drop that drag link down to match the new orientation of the pan hard bar because you lifted it. So this is not as strong as this, but it does, it, it, people get away with it most of the time. Now, when you start to get to something bigger, like a, a four inch, a six inch, an eight inch drop pitman arm, I, you're, you're playing with fire. The more drop you have, the less likely I would recommend you go off road. So you'll see a lot of like really jacked up F-350s and stuff. They're super tall and like 44 inch tires and, and stuff like that. I wouldn't take that off road. You're really playing with fire because you put a lot of extra load on your sector shaft. So this is the breakdown of the inside of a steering box. Super, super basic breakdown. There is a little bit more to it than this, but you can at least get the idea. You've got the sector shaft that connects to your pitman arm. It's splined down here at the bottom. That sector shaft goes to a worm shaft. Sometimes people can strip the gears out of here, but it's not very common. The two most common breaks that I see are stress fractures in the top of the sector shaft, or they'll do a clean break off the bottom. Stress fractures would be caused from too much side load and the material that the sector shaft is made out of just can't handle it. So you hit the yield strength of that material and then once it comes back from the yield strength, it's no longer 100% strength anymore. It's you know 70 or 50 or whatever. So then you'll slowly start to wear stress fractures in it because it is no longer at 100% strength. Now the clean break is typically caused from a drop pitman arm because it's not just having the twisting force on this sector shaft but it's also got some side forces from it going from side to side as well. So the more drop you have in your pitman arm, the more side to side forces you're gonna have and the more often you're gonna see brakes like this. I mean, that's, that's a nightmare scenario. You've got no steering once that breaks off. So now it's time to get started on ours and see how close to this stock orientation we can stay.
steampunk looking contraption we just built is the new Pittman arm, at least it's gonna be. It's not welded yet, but everything is tacked together and you can see the shape that I'm going for here. A couple things to talk about. One, I made a, I traced the original Pittman arm to make sure that this fits the same profile, uh, especially to make sure that it fits the same hole to hole profile. So if I had to do some funky shapes and maneuvers, I know that it's still gonna work and this fits the original profile really well. Another thing, engineer it to make sure that you can still put your Pitman Arm Puller around it. My Pitman Arm Puller still fits this shape just fine, so I know that once I zip this back on there, I can get it back off. I guarantee some people have not thought about this step, and then uh, if they wanna get their Pitman Arm back off, they've had to cut it off or, or do something really extreme. So it's something definitely worth considering. Also, I added lots of gusseting. Now these are weird looking shapes and it gives it this really strange looking uh, look, but I think that it's really important to make sure that the shape that you uh, come up with is very boxed in and very rigid. I don't want this to slowly like work on some welds over time and start to build cracks. So by making this really rigid and boxed in, it's gonna keep it from having any leverage to work down any of these welds. Also, these holes right here are to give me extra surface area to weld. I'm gonna be marrying these two different materials uh, all the way around, but this is just, you know, it's cheat code. This is a little bit extra grab that I'm gonna have between the mild steel and the cast steel, so I definitely wanted to take advantage of that. I did that top and bottom. So the next step is gonna be to weld this up. I'm not gonna do anything special. Uh, this is definitely mild steel. I could tell whenever I was grinding it and uh, drilling a hole in it, so, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn my machine all the way up. I'm gonna make sure I lay in lots of heat and I'm just gonna cook in some nice fat welds. Not a pretty Pittman arm, but it's my Pittman arm. All the welds laid in just about perfect. I've got no porosity anywhere, and uh, it was very easy to marry these two different materials. I mean, they're both steel after all. We've got cast steel and mild steel, uh, and with the welder turned all the way up like that, I mean, it was turning this thing blue. It was, it had plenty of penetration, plenty of heat. So now what I wanna do is I wanna bolt this in place, and I wanna do a test fit to see exactly how much clearance we gained. Moment of truth, are we going to get the results we wanted? I can already tell that this is higher uh, wheel travel than we had before. And I stopped it at like, I don't know, an eighth inch or so. It's gonna be so hard to see in the camera. But we have like an eighth inch gap between the top of the tie rod and the bottom of the pitman arm. So, and then if the other side flexes down, it's only gonna increase that gap. So I, th I think this is gonna be pretty accurate in terms of what we're gonna see once we get it on some dirt. So right now we are at like five and an eighth of wheel travel. And I think that this is as high as we can get with our tire. So half of a 37 should be about right there. And we have like three eighths of an inch between the top of the tire and the bottom of our fender. So for rough estimation, this looks like it is going to work. Now, once you bolt tires on, um, and you start to cycle the suspension with your limit straps and everything else, It's things will change a little bit. But right now it looks like we're sitting pretty. Also, I'm being very, um, I don't know, what's the word? I'm being very optimistic <laughs> in the idea of keeping it at this ride height. I think that more than likely it's gonna be like an inch or so taller than I think um, it's gonna be. So that being said, we're probably gonna end up with like six and an eighth inches of up travel. Right now, I think that we figured out this issue at least the best we can at this part of the project, and we're ready to move on to the next step. Now it's time for a quick Q&A segment based on the questions that I was asked in the comment section of the last video. First one is from Omar Bazu Bazua. 
are you going to bring back the Liberty videos? I'm definitely gonna bring back the Liberty videos. I, my attention span goes all over the place. And then on top of that, whatever the next big event that I need to make it to, I will just work on that vehicle like crazy to get to that event. So right now I'm working on the disco like crazy because in October I'm gonna be on trail to SEMA with it. And uh, I have to get this thing done. I wanna get a couple trips on it before I drive. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna trailer it. I'm gonna drive it like 3000 miles. So I'm, I'm going real hard on the disco. But plan right now is that once I get back from trail to SEMA, I wanna start hammering on the Liberty and start uh, doing some more stuff on the J10. Next question is from Goatworks. Do you think you could work out your middle example four link layout on your J truck? Yes, I do. I think that because the J truck has wider frame rails, it opens up a lot more space back there. Um, it looks like it, would, it wouldn't be impossible by any stretch of the imagination. Just build a nice heavy duty cross member um, for those lower links to join into. And when this guy says middle example, he's talking about the double triangulated four link. It's difficult to package, but there's certain instances like a pickup truck where I think that's probably the easiest place that you could package a suspension system like that. This question is from E. Alva. Do you recommend disconnecting the bat vehicle's battery when welding onto the frame, being how sensitive most computer modules are? Great build, man. I never have until this build that I'm working on right now. So with the Disco, I disconnected the battery just to make sure nothing had any juice in it. Um, but I've never even worried about it ever. I, I've spent a lot, I'm no 12 volt expert. I never want anyone to think that I claim to be, but I have spent a lot of time um, understanding how ECU gets and like how it receives and sends signals. And I've built um, harnesses and all kinds of things. I don't, based on the information that I have now and the amount of hours that I have spent digging into how ECUs work, I don't have any reason to think that there is uh, that it's necessary to disconnect your ECU because it's going to interact with the welding signal in some way. That being said, it doesn't hurt to be careful. It doesn't hurt to be cautious and just disconnect stuff. I mean, it's, you will not hurt anything, but I don't see a reason why I've never seen an example. I've heard people say that they knew a guy that says he fried his ECU because he was welding on the vehicle. I I don't think that that is likely. I think it's more likely that someone took a power probe and charged up the wrong thing, or they crossed two wires, or I think that is a way more likely scenario um, than welding on a frame that is connected to an ECU. But once again, I did it on the disco just because I just thought about it, <laughs> but normally I don't. Carpo888, what kind of tubes are you using for the links? The upper links are inch and three quarter DOM, um, and I believe they're eighth inch wall. The lower tubes are two inch DOM and it's quarter inch wall. This question is from GeoHandler99. Hi Nate, love the videos. Question, I see how you set the ride height of the axle sitting on the jack stands by using your tire height, but how do you determine the ride height of your vehicle on jack stands when you're mocking everything up? Or does it not matter to be too exact? Also, is the house next door to you for sale? I need a neighbor like you. Happy birthday to your daughter, Drago. Thank you very much for the birthday wishes. Um, I don't think there's any houses for sale near me right now. Um, but the way that I did this one is I knew that I was going to reuse the springs. I knew that I liked the height that it was at. And I, I think that it might have to go higher, but we'll see. So the goal is to stick very similar to the height that it was before. And so what I did is I just took some measurements whenever I was taking everything apart. So whenever I jacked it up and set it on the jack stands, I was able to get it at what I thought ride height was gonna be. But you really, you just need to be within a couple inches in most cases, unless you're trying to do like a crazy low center of gravity build where you have to know exactly where everything's going, then it gets a little bit more complicated. But for the most part, you can just get it close and be, if you build your, your links correctly, it'll be able to absorb a little bit of uh, change one way or the other. That's it for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I love seeing progress on this disco build and I just like the rest of you, I wanna see it on the trail. So I'm gonna be working like crazy over the next month to get this thing on the trail ASAP. If you enjoyed the video and you like what you saw, give it a thumbs up. Ring the bell if you want to get notifications whenever I come out with a new video. And if you want to help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. T-shirts, hats. I still have the net gator back here from the last video when I showed the new net gator. Um, and then we also have a link to our Patreon account as well. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.